All right, so it's five years. It's been five years, and we're still here. <laughs> now look, when we, when we first met in Washington five years ago, for NatCon 1, it didn't, it didn't even have a name yet at the time. Later, it got called NatCon 1. When we first met, we thought we had something very clear and simple to say. We thought we were going to say, look, we think that you can't understand politics if your politics isn't built around national independence, national interests, and national traditions. We thought it was simple, short, and clear. And as Chris said, it scared everybody. Ooh, national, what are they talking about? They must be racists. <laughs> Ooh, national interest, that means they're selfish racists. They are all only interested in their own race. National traditions, that, that means they, they actually want to honor past racists. <laughs> well, that, that's what they were saying. And now it's five years later, and I, I think we should stop and say, we actually won that battle. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, people on the far, on the, on the new Marxist woke left, you know, they'll continue calling us Nazis until the cows come home. But on the right, people are, are not afraid to use the word nation anymore. They're not afraid to use the word nationalist anymore. It's become, as Chris said, the mainstream. And I'd say that if we look at these five years, if we look across them, we can see a rapid trajectory of, of growth and success. In the United States, in the UK, France, Italy, Sweden, Hungary, Poland, Israel, India, and many other smaller countries, we've seen national conservatism go from being some, a curiosity to being something that everybody's got to talk about, to being something that is very close to being the dominant, the dominant intellectual and political agenda on the right in the democratic world. Now that's a great success. That's much, much more success than we have any right to imagine. And I say this, you know, taking into account the fact that there are ups and downs, the fact that the sweep of it is success doesn't mean that every single election is won it, <laughs> far from it. I mean, our friends in Poland right now are, are under a German occupation government. So that's not a success for us. But in general, in general, I would say that we're going from strength to strength. We didn't have any right to expect this degree of success. And it does feel, as Rabbi Zupnik said at dinner last night, it does feel just a little bit like God is prospering our way. On the other hand, you know, I, I wouldn't want to go five minutes and be upbeat the whole time. <laughs> On the other hand, I think that the challenges that have been put in our way are, are surprising, they're, they're shocking. 20, 2019, summer of 2019, when we had the first, the first NatCon, the first Edmund Burke Foundation National Conservatism Conference in Washington, it's funny, we all thought that, you know, the big opponents were going to be the liberals. You know, like we had to defeat the liberals, and we had, we'd be fine. We were pretty sure we could do that. By 2020, the United States had undergone cultural revolution. Those old liberals who we thought that we could probably do a pretty handy job defeating lost to this radical neo-Marxist revolutionary movement, the woke neo-Marxists, who took over the, you know, first the New York Times and then the rest of the media. And, and at first Princeton University, and then all, all the universities, the schools, the army, the bureaucracy. 2020 really was a year of cultural revolution in America and in Britain and in other countries beyond. And 2023 is another year of cultural revolution. If that first year of cultural revolution, if anybody can remember all the way back then, the summer of George Floyd, that first cultural revolution 
its slogan was systemic racism. Remember that? Systemic racism. The neo-Marxists were going to teach, teach Americans and Europeans that their societies are systemically racist. And that slogan had behind it a target. It was targeting a particular enemy. And that enemy was conservatives, whites, Christians. Who else would be systemically racist? Conservative white Christians. By the way, you all know I don't particularly enjoy bringing racial categories into the discussion, but that's who they were targeting. That's who they were targeting. It was conservatives and whites and Christians. In 2023, the same people, the same street fighters, the same uh, shock troops, the same organiza organizations who are training them, the same shadowy, wealthy, powerful institutions that are preparing them for battle, they have a new slogan in 2023. It's called Genocide in Gaza. All right? Notice the subtle shift from systemic racism to genocide in Gaza. You know, by the way, I, I tell my, my Jewish friends that, um, you know, they're always saying that uh, uh, you should worry about what's happening to the Jews in your country because, you know, the, the Jews are always first. And it's not true, the Jews aren't first in this case. In this case, the white Christian conservatives were first. But as of 2023, the alliance of woke neo-Marxists and Islamist, Islamic supremacist organizations, that bizarre alliance, um, has decided to include uh, all, basically all Jews in America, all Jews in Europe, certainly the Jews in Israel. Now, now being Jewish is being targeted, and that's kind of, you know, leaves a lot of liberal Jews in a strange place. I, I'm not, that's not me, I was never liberal, um, ever, not like for five minutes, never. <laughs> but it leaves li liberal American Jewry, which is most Jews in America, it leaves them in kind of an odd place because they thought that the purpose of, of, the, of, of the progressive left was to get rid of the, you know, the Christian the, 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 the Christian conservative uh, whites. And then it turns out that it's the Christian conservative whites and the Zionists, by which they mean the Jews. So I don't know how many more groups they're going to target, but for the time being, um, we are facing a completely new terrain on which being conservative or white or nationalist for sure, or Christian, or Jewish, being any of those things, places you in the crosshairs, places you in the elites that need to be overthrown, the targets of the cultural revolution, the people who need to be pushed out of every university and every school system and, 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 and every gov government, uh, every government agency, and out of the military, and certainly out of political power, that's the goal. That is the goal. And the degree to which it is succeeding is breathtaking. It's astonishing. I, my, my wife and I were hosted in, in India last summer, uh, a life-changing experience by our, our, our Indian friends, some of whom are here today. A life-changing experience. India is a different civilization with a whole different history, a different worldview, a different way of thinking. But when you go to India today, they're all sitting around the table saying, DEI has taken over all of our universities. What are we going to do? I mean, this is, this is rapidly spread across the entire democratic world. It's victorious everywhere. And if I began my talk by saying, by saying, look how much we've succeeded, look how much we've done in five years, I have to temper the excitement. I have to admit that however successful we are, our opponents, our enemies, when I say enemies, I, I, I mean people who want to make sure that we don't have any foothold in power, that we're 
completely illegitimate, delegitimized, that we don't have the slightest say at the table, we don't have a seat at the table, we're not part of power in Western countries, in democratic countries anymore. Our enemies have succeeded far, far more than we have. Right? That's important. In these five years, the terrain has gotten much harder and much worse, much more difficult for us. So even as we come together, we become more solid, we think more clearly, we understand who our opponents are, we understand what we're trying to achieve, but they're moving faster than we are. Right? Now that doesn't mean we're not going to win, but it means that we really, really need to pick up the pace. I want to say a couple of things about what we need for the next five years, okay, and, and, and sooner. Let me talk about three, three things, three key concepts to guide our movement going forward. I want to talk about clarity, I want to talk about unity, and I want to talk about restoration. Clarity. Look, many of the people who are involved in NatCon are intellectuals. Many of us, you know, enjoy philosophical debates, histor his his historical debates, theological debates. We love all that stuff. It's kind of like what we'd rather be doing much of the time. But there's a problem with uh, these exercises, these efforts to get the truth right, right, which is the heart and soul of a philosopher, a theologian, a religious figure, a political theorist. The heart and soul of it is we want to get everything right. We want to get it exactly right. And that means that we get into all sorts of very, very abstruse, complicated discussions. But when you're trying to affect the real world, not the academic world, the real world, when you're trying to make changes in the political realm, in the public sphere, in the public life of a nation, when that's what you're trying to do, you can't have all of this subtlety and, clar subtlety and blurriness. You need clarity. You need clarity for action. Without clarity, there is no possible action. Without clarity, there's just confusion. Without clarity, you look like the British Tory party. <laughs> and this movement has been, on certain crucial points, absolutely clear from the very outset. That's a very large part of our success. We've been clear on immigration. We've been clear that no, you can't have the borders open and have, ha, have them thrown open for endless immigration from, from China, from South America, from the Middle East. You cannot do that indefinitely and have anything remain of your country. Right? We've been clear. Our statement of principles opens the door for the first time for immigration moratorium. Right? That's pretty clear. Immigr without a change in immigration policy, without getting control of the border, without being able to stabilize the home population, the democratic nations are finished. Okay, we were clear about it. We're also pretty clear about manufacturing. This old theory that it didn't make any difference if you manufactured computer chips or potato chips, well, we know that's not true. We know that's... It, it, it would be comical if it weren't such a terrible, awful blunder in thinking. No, your people need to be able to make things. They need to be able to make medicines. They need to be able to make weapons. If you can't make medicines and you can't make weapons, then you can't heal yourself unless you're, it's China that wants you to heal. And you, you can't defend yourself unless it's China that wants you to be able to defend yourself, and, and they don't. So we've been clear about manufacturing. Maybe we could have been a little bit clearer, and at this conference we will be, that if you want to return to manufacturing, then you need energy. Right? You, if, if we had manufacturing, we wouldn't, be able to, we, we wouldn't have the energy to be able to back it up. So we have to be clear about this. No more fantasies. It doesn't matter how many of those, you know, those, those wind farms you, 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 you put in your backyard. You'll never be able to sustain an actual manufacturing base that's capable of doing what this country needs to do, or any other country, which means nuclear, it means oil, it means gas. 
Okay, we've been, we've been clear and we have to be clearer on it. We have been clear, but we need to be clearer about children. It doesn't matter how many immigrants you have. If you are not having children, your nation is finished. And so this is not just a matter of government policy. This is a matter for, for every home, for every individual, for every church and synagogue, for every movement, for every educational institution. If you're not teaching people to have children, you're not in the game. You don't understand what this is all about. What this is all about is that America has now followed Europe into an inability to, to, to guarantee even one more generation of, 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 of Americans. The shrinkages were down to 1.6 women, 1.6 children per woman in the United States. This is suicide, my friends. All right, so let's be clear about this. Absolutely everything about national conservatism has to be focused one way or another on convincing people that the only honorable thing to do enlightened self-interest, as people used to like to say. The only honorable thing to do, as I think national conservatives would like to say, the only honorable thing is to get married and have children, lots of children, and raise them. Right? And if you're not doing that, then what you're doing is dishonorable. All right, but now let's talk about those kids. If you're raising a lot of kids, and you're sending them to schools, you know, where they're being turned into woke neo-Marxists, and many of you are, I don't think, we're not talking about like people outside of this room, we're talking about people in this room. You're sending your kids to those schools with woke neo-Marxist teachers, and then to universities where they're cut off, entirely cut off from where they grew up, and just, you know, get to watch the eternal debate between, between you know, uh, uh, Rawlsian liberalism and woke neo-Marxism, right? Do not expect your children to come home and be your children, because they're going to be their children. And so we need much more focus on this. In order to talk intelligently about how to raise and educate children, we cannot continue to avoid the following problem. Vouchers are not enough. A free market in education is not enough. For 50 years we've been hearing about free market and education and now it's actually beginning to happen. But look at the universities in the United States. There's 4,000 institutions of higher education in the United States. It's not exactly a free market, but it's pretty, you know, those 4,000 institutions, they could, they could each have a different curriculum. They could each have one, you know, just the, 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 the interests of individuals in different institutions can motivate them to be different from one another, but they're the same. They're peas in a pod. It's 4,000 institutions that look exactly the same as one another. All right? the, the market mechanism is helpful when we initiate dramatic, innovative change to make things better, and the market mechanism is worthless when we sit still on our hands and say we don't need to do anything because the market is going to take care of it. Now I want to start with something really small. And I, I understand, I'm, I, this is not going to make everybody necessarily happy. I want to start with something really small. I hate litmus tests. I do. I, I, I'm constantly telling people, do not tell me that someone shouldn't speak at NatCon because he or she disagrees with most of us about some particular issue. I hate litmus tests. It's not the way to build a movement. But I think, I've, I think that, that the state of Louisiana has actually come up with a pretty darn good test of whether you're a conservative or not. And here it is. And, and don't think I'm talking about something trivial. I know you're thinking it, but don't think it. Just hold on. The state of Louisiana has come up with a simple, a simple law that the Ten Commandments should be posted in every classroom in the state. Okay? By the way, the Ten Commandments have a lot more in them than the commandments. The, the, there's like all sorts of other, other cool stuff, so they're really the Ten Precepts, but we'll let, let, let's, let's go with the way you call them. Okay, the Ten Commandments, okay, the Ten Commandments. So 
I would think that you couldn't possibly be a conservative and have a problem with the Ten Commandments being posted on, you know, on the walls of the, your kid's school. How can you have a problem with it? The Ten Commandments, that, that, that's like the founding, the founding moral law of our civilization for 3,000 years, right? So it, it, I mean, it's, just, it's just what we all agree on, or what, what, what we did until a few years ago. Like, Protestants and Catholics can agree to it, and, and they can agree with Jews, and I, you know, I think probably even you know, conservative Muslims and Hindus, they, 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 they could probably say, yeah, you know, this, that, that's pretty good for you Westerners. <laughs> it's the, the, the only thing we can agree on. If we can't agree on that, then there's nothing we can agree on. Now, everybody is reacting to the state of Louisiana. And by the way, Texas and Oklahoma are working on Bible curriculums for the public schools. So, look, I know everybody's got a reason to oppose this. Everybody, everybody's got some crazy reason to oppose it. I never thought, never, ever thought that I would be quoting Wittgenstein and I promise to not do it again. <laughs> Wittgenstein has this lovely image. He says, what's philosophy for? It's, like, it's to help the fly get out of the fly bottle. America struggling to figure out why we just can't have the Ten Commandments on the walls of the kids' schools. Is, is a fly in a fly bottle buzzing around, bouncing off the walls. Oh, we've got, we've got all these principles. We've got separation of church and state. And I say to you, just, just knock it off. Get out of the bottle. Just put the Ten Commandments on the kids' wall. And then somebody says, oh, no, 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 no. No, but the state has to be neutral. And I say to you, get out of the fly bottle. Just get it. Just put it on the walls. No, seriously, some, some, some rabbi wrote for the Wall Street Journal, I'm against having the Ten Commandments on the school walls because it's the wrong, uh, it, 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 it's the wrong version. It's not the Hebrew version, it's uh, some Greek, they don't even include, you know, the first command. Look, stop, just stop it. Get out of the fly bottle, just put it on the walls. Just stop all this nonsense. You know what? If we all decided we'd put the Ten Commandments on the walls, then we could have a really interesting argument about the foundations of our civilization. And it should it be the, the Hebrew version or the Greek version? Does it include the parts that aren't commandments? Doesn't it? How do you number them? This is all really interesting. But as long as the only thing that is, you can put uh, in, in the classrooms is, that, is, is the rainbow flag, as long as that's what we're arguing about, so knock off all these arguments about which version of the Ten Commandments, it doesn't matter. Just put something on the wall. <laughs> now, I, I actually think, and, and you, you, you may think that this is, um, again, not important enough. I think it's really important. I think movements, a movement needs a flag. You know, you look at, you look at that rainbow flag, and, and, you know, it keeps growing and changing. My wife and I were in a bookstore in DuPont Circle. There were three different versions of the rainbow flag. So it's like ecumenical. There's like a, there's, no, really, there's, there, there was like a, a kid, there was a kid there saying, saying, saying to his father, like, what is that, Dad? And he said, oh, it's a rainbow flag. And the kid says, you mean it's like those are the colors of the rainbow? And he said, yeah. And like, like black and brown? Those are colors of the rainbow? Yeah, what are you, you, you just, just stop that, kid. That's the rainbow. But, Dad, it has mauve and pistachio. <laughs> it's the rainbow at a very high level of abstractions. A movement needs symbols. The American flag is a wonderful symbol. Americans should fly it everywhere as much as you can. But what kind of American are you? If you're an American who believes that America is anchored to Christian civilization, to Jewish and Christian civilization, if you believe that that is what shaped and formed and gave life and meaning and purpose to America, 
then you cannot be embarrassed to have the Ten Commandments displayed. Let's make the Ten Commandments our symbol. Put it up, not just in the school, just put it up everywhere. What kind of American are you? I'm the kind of American who believes that there is a fundamental moral basis to civilization and we actually know what it is. That's clarity. If we can get to that, that would be clear. Ten Commandments, that's us. That would be clarity. Let me talk about clarity in one other place. Foreign policy. There's a tremendous amount of confusion. You know, I, I, people, people, reporters, Washington people, serious, serious people call me up and they say, Yoram, what's going on with that isolationist movement that you're involved in? And I say, what? You know, like, I, I, I mean, I know thousands, literally thousands of nationalist conservatives. And you know, there, there's, you know, there's 5% who are isolationists or something. They're kind of funny people. You know, the, 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 the people who think it's just, it doesn't matter what, what happens in the world at all, like we shouldn't care. So, okay, so there's 5%, 10%. But we do need a new foreign policy and we need to be clear about it. The old foreign policy was built on the idea that America, as a liberal country, had a job of exporting liberalism to every country in the world using American armed force. We didn't need any other armies, we didn't need any other powers except tokens. Why? Because Americans were so strong and so right, and I can't tell you how many of my old neoconservative, neoliberal friends used to say things like, come on, you can't let the Europeans be responsible for fighting their own wars. They're idiots. <laughs> I, I, I didn't say that. I, I've just heard it over and over again for decades. Come on, you, 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 you can't trust Europeans and, and the Middle East and, and Asia. You can't trust them. We know what we're doing. We Americans know what we're doing. That's the, that's the old foreign policy. All right, so that old foreign policy, that doesn't work anymore. <laughs> that doesn't work anymore. Nobody thinks Americans know what they're doing. <laughs> what should be our foreign policy? I'll tell you, and I want this to be clear, absolutely clear. Americans' foreign policy should be to have strong allies, powerful allies, Instead of America saying, oh, we need to defend our allies. No, America doesn't need to defend America's allies. The reason you have allies is not so you defend somebody. The reason you have allies is so that they defend you. So if there are countries like Britain or France, Poland, Greece, Israel, India, Australia, Japan, countries that are willing to build themselves up to be military powers, to be serious powers, to be able to look out for American interests, then they're worth having as allies. And if they're not willing to do that, they aren't allies, they're just some protectorate that you're spending your money and your kids' lives on defending because they're too lazy to do it. So I think that should be clear as well. And we'll talk about that a lot at this conference. So let me just wrap up. I said we need three things. Clarity, unity, and restoration. Clarity we've discussed. Unity, I'll just put in a small pitch. When we started NatCon, it was not a unified movement. It was internally divided by endless theories. We have Straussians, lots of Straussians. We have, we have natural law rationalists. At first I thought they were all Catholic, then it turned out that they're Protestants too. Lots of natural law rationalists. We have Burkeans. We have Machiavellians. <laughs> They're the ones who are going, I'm not going to let you know what it is, I think. <laughs> Those are the Machiavellians. And everybody didn't trust everybody else. Now it's five years later, and you know what? Okay, so occasionally somebody carps you know, writes an article and says, oh no, why are we uniting with all those people in those other camps? But you know what the truth is? Those four tribes of national conservatism, with every passing month, we're better friends, we work better together, we trust one another, we still have our debates, and that's going to go on forever, thank God, but we are a uni united 
unified movement. And now we need to take that a step further. Protestants. We had a beautiful display at MatCon 3 of, 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 of Protestant unity. It was absolutely, like, heart-throbbing. It was absolutely moving. It was beautiful, brilliant. And then I'm, I'm sorry to say that all too many Protestants have spent the last year and a half since then, like, attacking one another. Now, cut it out! No, enough! I, no, I know, I know. I know this is like a Protestant tradition as you have to spend the next few hundred years killing each other. Just stop that! We don't have time for this. We don't, we don't. And you're going to get to see at this conference what, what some real Protestant unity looks like. God willing. Christians. Okay, fine, I know. I've, 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 I've heard all the... I, that, this is what I do with my time. This is like, you know, Jewish leader of the movement. You sit there and you listen to the Catholics, every complaint that they have about the Protestants, and then what the Protestants have to say about the Catholics. And it's all fine... But just stop it. Just cut it out. Just cut it out. We don't have time for this. We do need to answer questions like how are Protestants and Catholics going to coexist in, the, uh, in those states in America that become more and more Christian? We need to answer those questions. We need to answer questions about, you know, what kind of room is there going to be for, for Jews? For, for Hindus and for, for, for Muslims who want to be part of that kind of society. We need to answer those questions, but before anything else, we need unity. And that begins with Protestant unity and Christian unity and, and, and the unity of people who are willing to back the Ten Commandments. Right? That's where we're going. Restoration. Our goal is restoration. The kids say all the time, there's nothing left to, be, to conserve. How can you be conservative? There's nothing left to conserve. I understand that question. Our civilization is to a very significant degree rubble. I understand that question. But I say to you personally that if you think that restoration is impossible in this country or in your life, that's because you're lazy. That's because you're lazy. It's because you're not willing to read. A lot of the people saying, well, we didn't inherit anything. I'm sorry, a lot of you young people, you know this very well. You don't read books. And then you're telling me you didn't inherit anything. <laughs> young man, get a young woman, get married, join a church. Join a congregation. Join a place where the great inheritance is being handed down. Or a synagogue. Join a place where it's happening for real, in real life. And if your church is not a place where it's happening, move to a different church. And if it doesn't exist in your state, move to a different state. Because without, without restoration of you personally, your spirit, your family, your connection to a congregation, to a tradition, and to God, and to scripture, without that, you will not end up being what it is you think that someday maybe you could be. There is a way to do it. There is a way, but it requires restoration. First, you restore yourself, you restore your community, and then once you have a community, we'll hear about that at this conference also, once you have a restored community, then you try, to, you try for a state, a whole state that's restored, and then a whole country, right? That's clear. If we're united, we can achieve that kind of restoration. It's what's going to happen. Just do it. Do the work. Stop being lazy. Just do it. It's going to happen. Thank you. God bless you all. Ooh.